December 28th will mark the 48th anniversary of the bombing of Bell Turbot. In 1972, just three days after Christmas, a no-warning car bomb killed two teenagers and injured nine others. 47 years later, we're still no further on. Tonight, we uncover a crippling lack of trust between police services north and south. Those were huge obstacles to any effective investigation. We question the political will to bring those behind the Bell Turbot bomb to justice. Do I think there was sufficient uh, political priority uh, to deal with uh, the, the murder of two children in the state? Absolutely not. And we reveal new evidence that British security forces failed to act on credible information, allowing militant loyalists to operate freely in South Fermanagh. Maybe this goes further up the chain. The Woodford River, just north of Bell Turbot, separates County Cavan from County Fermanagh, marking the border between the Republic and Northern Ireland. <laughs> On Thursday night, December 28, 1972, a Ford Escort from Enniskillen passed a guard at checkpoint at Ahalane, headed south for Bell Turbot, across the River Shannon, up Bridge Street past the Diamond before parking in Main Street, across the road from Slowey's Chip Shop. It was here the car bomb was primed and left waiting. There were other visitors to the town that evening. A delivery truck arrived late, so the driver and his 16-year-old helper, Patrick Stanley from Clara County Offaly, booked into McCall's B&B for the night. Eileen McCall was 15 at the time. My mother had the flu, so I went down and brought them in, showed them their room, and then I made them a big feed of rashes and sausages. After they had eaten, we wanted to ring his mother to let her know that he was staying in our B&B. We didn't have a house phone at that time, so I sent him across to the local shop. Garage owner Paddy O'Reilly watched the evening traffic pass by. There's times these things all come back to you. It was the tourist of night. I used to run the petrol pumps that time, maybe 12, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning. Two kilometres away, Anthony O'Reilly was giving his older sister Frances a lift home. His younger sister Geraldine, aged 15, tagged along. Anywhere I was going in the car, she came for the spin, you know, with me. She was a little sister and be kind of looking after her, you know. The phone in the shop was being used, so Patrick Stanley found another one outside the post office, directly across the road from Slowey's chip shop, where Ian Elliott was already in line. I sat my cousin after coming from table tennis. Next minute went in, we ordered chips. Didn't see any car acting funny or anything. So we come on down to Slowey's Chip Chap and I come on up and I couldn't see a parking place so so I just double parked and Geraldine got out of the car and she went in to the chip shop there. This young lady came in, it was Geraldine. We spoke. That was it. There was no warning. No one. No one. Oh, everything was going on. No, quite a hundred percent normal. Then all of a sudden, bang. End the story. Freelance photographer Paddy Ronahan was among the first on the scene. His camera capturing fear and shock, chaos and destruction in a border town. I ran up the town and, um, oh, there was mayhem. I mean, there was cars upside down, there was people crying, there was people screaming. Oh, something I'll never forget. The longest day I live, I will never. That's where I got that scar there. Of a plate glass window that blew into my face. I was lucky, very, very lucky. 
I looked down the street, it was a wall of fire. The car with the bomb must have harshed the road, so I didn't know what had happened until I came to it. Anthony's escape was miraculous. But in the darkness of the wrecked chip shop, his worst fears came to pass. So they brought me back up and uh, I went in and identified her laying on the floor. And uh, I knew it was Charlie. It was all dark, but I knew by the clothes she was wearing that it was Charlie laying there anyway. So, so they brought me back out then and brought me to her. Across the road, a coat was placed over the second fatality, Patrick Stanley. Oh. Ah. Sure. It's all that water under the bridge now, and you offer it up, and you hope he's in heaven, the wee lad. That's it. The Stanley family in Clara thought Patrick was on his way home. Well, the priest arrived to the house. Mammy was at the top of the stairs and she Joe, what's wrong? And he said, um, Paddy's dead. And she said, no, Joe, you're mistaken. Couldn't be. And it went from there. There the nightmare began. And even the next day, coming through the town, it was, when it was bright, nine o'clock, we were heading up. I was in up the cabin to my walk, and the street looked a sight. Well, we wind and uh, outside the, the street, blowing in or blowing out, slates coming up, roofs, you know. A war zone, that's what it was. I saw Jolene's boot, her long, tan boot uh, outside uh, a pub on the diamond. You recognised her boot? I recognised her boot from from what she used to wear because I used to walk her home and she, they were a pair of boots she loved. They were tan boots. But it was only one boot. And I wondered, how did that get there? Paddy O'Reilly was interviewed the morning after. Hey, Paddy O'Reilly, what happened to you last night? Mm -hmm. I was on the petrol pumps. I was giving out petrol. I was standing in the office looking out the window and the glass was blue in around me. I didn't know exactly what had happened in the beginning until I heard the bang. I went back in and I lifted the phone and I rang the post office in Cavan to send me down as many ambulances as they could. I went out on the street after that to help out, to give a helping hand out the best I could. I got the young lad that was killed in the kiosk. I would have to go down possibly on the one knee or down low and pull them out round. They got him out on the foot, but and I stooped in under him, lifted him up, carried him up to the showrooms. And what was going through your mind, Paddy, when you were walking up with him? Well, the whole thing that's been through my mind was the act of contrition. Justice for the forgotten campaigner, Margaret Irwin, has examined events closely. How guard the detectives and technical staff from Dublin descended on Belturbet. The local guardie, interviewed people, took statements, etc. But then it all came to a halt because the um, investigation report was sent, um, presumably, to the Garda Commissioner on the 25th of January, which is just less than a month after the bombing on the 28th of December. Like, I mean, why? Why? Why not pursue it? Um, I know there was a lot going on at the time. He was still our brother. He deserved, he and Geraldine O'Reilly, they both deserved something to be done about it. And there wasn't anything done about it. But Belturbet was not the only town targeted in the Republic that night. No warning bombs exploded in Clonus, County Monaghan, and 100 metres from the Fermanagh border in Mullinagold, County Donegal, all in sequence. Clonus at 10.01, Belturbet at 10.28, and Mullen Nagode at 10.50. You had three bombs exploding in the space of an hour, so that was certainly very well organised. The Mullen Nagode bomb was left outside a pub 
causing extensive damage. Fortunately, no injuries, but little else was known about it. Cars used in the two other attacks were both stolen that day in Enniskillen, a red Ford Escort and a blue Morris 1100. When the Morris was driven into Clonus that evening, it passed two Gardaí on patrol. The RUC had yet to notify the Gardaí of the stolen car, as was standard practice, so the bombers drove up from Anna Street without arousing any suspicion. It was the first of many failings in communication between police services, north and south. We know very little about Clonus, in fact, because unfortunately the Garda investigation file into Clonus is missing. There's just a, a little bit about the, um, the explosive and that's about it. Clonus was significant. Of course, a number of people were, were quite badly injured in Clonus. But that is the story with all of the attacks, especially Dublin Monaghan, where so many files are missing, photograph albums missing. And what was the explanation given for the Clonus file gone missing? No explanation, just couldn't be found. When they were happy to clean it. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't clean it. The media interest didn't last long. Um, I know from looking at the newspapers afterwards, and you'd be looking to see, you know, where's this investigation going, what's happening? You're expecting them to say, we have these people, you know. And never anything, never a mention of it. Somebody knows. Somebody somewhere knows. Why are these people's lives forgotten? They don't deserve to be forgotten. They deserve justice. So how could this happen? The triple bombing on December 28th is not an atrocity without context. Hundreds of men from nationalist areas in the north were already interned without charge. January 1972 brought Bloody Sunday, which led to the British Embassy in Dublin being set alight. July brought Bloody Friday. By year's end, a total of 494 killings were recorded the most violent year of the Troubles. Sean Donlan was only a few months working in the Northern Ireland section of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. Relations between Dublin and London were very, very bad. Cooperation on security between the Guards and the RUC was virtually non-existent. So the whole thing was very, very fraught and uh, it was very difficult to deal with anything to do with cross-border matters. The British had decided that Northern Ireland was entirely a matter for the United Kingdom. They did not want any input from Dublin. Fermanagh's Senate county line runs for 230 kilometres, about half the entire border between north and south. Demographics here are unusual, with a very even split between Catholics and Protestants. Enniskillen journalist Denzel McDaniel knows it well. Suddenly the relationship started to fragment very badly and it did become a very divided place. Through the early 70s, the security forces were drawn almost exclusively from one side. It gave rise to nationalist distrust of the police and the UDR, a local regiment of the British Army. To be realistic about it, you know, initially in 1970 when the UDR was formed, it was a part-time militia. Whatever way you look at it, it was largely a Protestant militia. Um, Protestants did feel under siege. Uh, they saw it very much as their defence. Um, and there was on the ground, um, you know, Catholics stroke nationalists did feel that they were being uh, picked on, harassed by the UDR. So it very quickly became them and us situation. Summer of 72 also saw the rapid growth of the UDA, Ulster Defence Association. What started out as a defensive vigilante group soon became the biggest paramilitary loyalist body in the north, with up to 40,000 members. It remained a legal organisation for two decades. The political stage also shifted to harder ground. The vanguard movement capitalised on unionist anger over secret British government talks with the IRA. Its leader, Bill Craig, famously telling a Belfast rally, if and when the politicians fail us, it may be our job to liquidate the enemy. 
that if you declare war against our Constitution, then we will fight that war through to victory. The Vanguard movement really played on the fears uh, of ordinary Unionist people. Um, and it's the classic case, whether there were actual formal links with loyalist paramilitaries, <clears throat> but certainly he gave them moral cover and did whip people up with, with, uh, with very inflammatory speeches. And let's get this clear, when you say fight, do you mean take up arms, kill people? Yes, this is what I said last night. I want them to realise when they say fight, it does mean killing. Vanguard's rapid growth startled nationalists like Fermanagh South Tyrone MP Frank McManus, who the following year would survive an assassination attempt by loyalist gunmen. It was very tense. There's no doubt about that. It was very tense. If you spoke to people uh, at any length about it, they, they would say, Jesus, well, well, Frank, what's going to happen to us if, if uh, you know, if the prods do listen to Craig and, and decide to take some kind of... Uh, uh, action against us. What, what the hell are we going to do? Following a lead set elsewhere, the UDA attempted to create a no-go area in Enniskillen. Alarmed by developments, the Irish Army demanded urgent action. In a now declassified report, the Chief of Staff warned the Department of Defence the border requires more effective military cover because of the increase in cross-border activity by subversives and because of the UDA UVF threat. It was more than a threat. At an October rally in Enniskillen, Bill Craig applauded the UDA for carrying out a cross-border raid. We have to remind ourselves that people like Craig and Paisley in the early 70s were very different people to the people they eventually became. But I mean, I have no doubt Craig, particularly in 71, 72, I have absolutely no doubt um, that they created a climate where people, whether they were UVF, UDA or whoever, felt that they could do certain things. Ominously, Craig also told the crowd, loyalists have no regrets when it's considered necessary to hit at the Republic. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a invitation to go and do something serious. Two months later, Dublin was bombed. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Do you see a connection? Oh. <laughs> no, you, how, how could there possibly be uh, how could there possibly be a connection? Of course there's a connection. It's a dog whistle. No, not even a dog whistle. It's a direct instruction to listen. Don't stand here listening to me. Go and do something about it. Often overlooked, this attack on Dublin city centre saw two no-warning car bombs detonate inside 18 minutes. Two people were killed and more than 100 injured in last night's two bombings. And again, very good investigation to begin with, and uh, then it just all came to a halt. Nobody was ever charged or convicted. The bombings presented a fresh crisis for a recession-hit Irish state about to join the European community. Its authority challenged by Republican activists on one side, and now by loyalist paramilitaries on the other. In another review, the Irish Army Chief of Staff conceded bluntly that border security was outside the capabilities of the Defence Forces. What's more, the possibility of incursion by UVF, UDA and other elements into the South must also be guarded against. However, for Reverend Ivan Foster of Lisnesky, it was South Fermanagh that was under threat. It was an area that... Uh, was always targeted by the IRA and every Unionist Protestant young man felt it a duty to step forth, irrespective of the awful dangers, step forth to the defence of what we consider our homeland. But defenders of the homeland often paid a heavy price. UDR men were targeted in South Fermanagh a stark reality illustrated years later by Jack Leahy, once a Vanguard supporter and prominent Lisnesky businessman. Just as I turn down the main street on my, here on my right again, we've got Richard Latimer's hardware shop where he was shot behind the counter. We also have dra a draper shop. It has been bombed and burned several times. On my left, there's been a row of houses have been knocked with the bomb. That was the largest bomb that we had in Northern Ireland. Was the border porous? 
Yes, I think one would have to admit that it was. In my experience, the guards and the army were not equipped in the early 1970s for what was happening. This is the first foray you've made across the border. Do you plan to make more? Definitely. Oh, well. His work with the Free Presbyterian Church took Ivan Foster alongside Dr Ian Paisley into the Republic. Well, it's an exceedingly long border with innumerable unofficial crossings. I remember leaving Corrigari meetings. And I could see night by night like that the border was not closed by any means, not closed by any means, and it was very easy for it to be crossed by anyone who wished to bomb and murder. Fears of an unsecured border became a running sore, and if security was lax, all too easy for Republican paramilitaries going north, or, as border towns like Belturbet and Clonus would soon discover, for loyalist paramilitaries coming south. The bombing of Belturbet is inextricably linked to the old border crossing here at Atalane Bridge, where the Bullock family have lived for six generations. So, here we are, this is Ahalian Bridge. It's a big stone bridge that was built to, to, to link County Fermanagh to County Cavan during the, during the famine period. So it was the main thoroughfare from Donegal, Enniskillen, down to Dublin. This, this was, was the main, main road. road? This was the main road back in the day. A pretty busy road as well. Simon's mother, Joan Bullock, and her late husband, John Storey, lived here through the 1970s. There's always something going on, you know? There's one family, and when they went out to, to lift their creamery can, they had a bomb in it, you see? So, luckily enough, they, they weren't killed. But when things like that happened, you know, it, it, was, it was really very dangerous. But my husband, he said, if you start running, where are you going to end up? And he said he wasn't going, so that was it. And I wasn't leaving him. Despite serious concerns raised by the Irish Army, border security fell to on Garda Síochána under the Department of Justice. Many Gardaí came straight from training at Templemore, like Tosh Lavery and Pat McMorrow, posted to Ballyconnell for border duty, aged 19. We were equipped with nothing. You had a little baton that you got in Templemore in your pocket and a radio that sometimes they didn't work. Well, that's... That's the equipment that was issued to you at the time. That's what we had. Uh, we had no, nothing else to fall back on. There was 500 girls burning at the time. We were brought strictly into the job for that and to flood the border with men, young lads and uniforms and we'd look as if we had a, a big contingent along the border. The British Army were bold woods. Other locals would open them up again. And that was constantly going on. Uh, whereas the guard of patrols and, and, and the security at this side of the border was heavily, heavily present, certainly. But um, behind it all, uh, you have to admit that the border was porous with the amount of crossings you had there. Well, I mean, the Gordy were obviously focused on security at the border and south of the border, but there was no contact with the British Army in Northern Ireland. Last minute, the Irish Army was not authorised to have any contact with the British Army. And um, the structure for a proper relationship between the Gordie and the RUC had not yet been created. Soon three British helicopters are buzzing us. They sweep low to have a closer look. Then one lands a commando unit behind a nearby hill and the British charge down the fields to see if they've another border incident on their hands. They've no contact with the Irish troops, just a quick look and they withdraw to be picked up by their helicopter from a nearby field. You see them occasionally cross, cross, from, from across the border during operations or during checkpoints. No communication uh, by phone or by uh, radio or nothing like that. Very little contact with RUC. Tensions in this security vacuum spiralled when Joan's cousin, Tom Bullock, a UDR soldier, and his wife, Emily, were murdered at home in their farmhouse near Ahalane. Joan had met Emily that September afternoon. Yeah, she got her bicycle and she was holding her bicycle and a car came past. And very slowly, and there were men in it, and they were looking, and she said, well, those fellas will know us the next time they see us. And that was... Um, 
I was just a couple of hours before they came and murdered her. So that was the last time you saw her? Yeah, yes, that's right, yeah. It was just off. Sort of a terrible bloody thing, yeah. The Protestant neighbours of the Bullocks, you know, were convinced that the local intelligence was supplied by their neighbours, prob probably, most likely. And that's very difficult to, to come to terms with. It was reported that the IRA men who shot Tom and Emily then crossed back into Cavan uh, over the Atlane Bridge. Yes, and then they celebrated in a pub in Ballyconnell, they said. This is what you heard? No, it was someone who, who, who we knew was there at the time. Yeah. I have a, a list here of the men who were shot, UDR men, RUC men, part-time reservists, in our area, South Fermanagh. And it, it, it's a sizable account. And I don't think that very many were ever brought to court and convicted of the murder of those people. And that was part of the, that was, that was part of what made the terrorist campaign hard to bear. Mounting violence claimed two Catholic farm workers known as the Pitchfork Murders, for which British soldiers were convicted years later. But nobody was ever caught for murdering UDR man Robin Bell or Derry Lynn butcher Louis Leonard, posthumously honoured by the IRA. Something had to give. Achillean Bridge was I suppose it was uh, almost symbolic. Half of it was in the north and half of it was in the south. So um, loyalists did decide to take matters into their own hands and, and, and blow it up in, in, in November of 72. Loyalists knew this would be a criminal act, so they needed clearance from the security forces. Researching border relations in the 1970s, historian Dr. Edward Burke discovered a remarkable interview with Captain, later Major Vernon Rees, at the Imperial War Museum in London. Rees, who commanded British troops in West Fermanagh, recalls being approached by Jack Leahy in Listener Ski. Dreadful about Tom and Emily Bullock. I said, yeah, outrageous. He said, you know, would you feel better if that bridge wasn't there? And I said, yeah, of course I would, but there's no way we can do anything about that. He said, your men are forever patrolling in that area, Captain, he said. So I said, I know, it's one of the worst parts of our patch. He said, will you keep your soldiers away from it from 8 o'clock in the evening for four hours? And I went out and I thought, I've been suspended nearly twice. Am I about to cooperate with a terrorist in the Ulster Defence Association in the destruction of a main road in the United Kingdom? And I thought it would be wonderful if that bridge was down. So I leaked it through the special branch again, that there would be no soldiers on that bridge between eight o'clock this coming Thursday and midnight. Once they got the all clear from Captain Rees, loyalist extremists moved under cover of darkness and planted explosives on the Atalane Bridge. Well, God, there was a big knock on the door and I, I went down to see what was going on. And they said, there's a bomb on the bridge, get out, get everybody out. So, um, I... And did you know who it was? No, they had masks on, they were, they were, they, you know, they were camouflaged. And before we got very far, there was a big bomb, big uh, bang. The blast damaged but did not destroy the bridge. So next day, Captain Rees ordered his own men to finish off the job. Both the arch domes flew out, right, and their central arch collapsed, right? But I think, as a result of that being blown up, we saved dozens of lives of innocent-ish. I mean, no such thing as innocence in Northern Ireland. Um, people living in that area. Um, I don't know whether they could prosecute me still for this. Probably could. <laughs> what does that tape tell us? 
It tells us that um, if we accept uh, the words of Major Rees, it tells us that uh, there was a joint enterprise between the uh, between loyalists and an officer of the British Army to destroy a an approved uh, major route between uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So this is paramilitary loyalists. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And in this case, it was blowing up a bridge over which the IRA was coming and which the British government was not prepared to put something permanent there by way of a checkpoint or whatever to stop it. So the thinking of men was, we'll put a stop to it, blow it up. That loyalist paramilitaries should plant a bomb with the full knowledge and, more significantly, collaboration of the British Army would alarm most people, but there was much worse to come, for it set in train a calamitous sequence of events. Fearing the economic impact of closing a main road, Cavan County Council ignored unionist objections and put down a Bailey Bridge. It was a slap in the face, them repairing a bridge that had been used by the IRA. It was seen as extremely provocative. As far as the, um, the Protestant population in South Fermanagh were concerned, the IRA were going to use this route again to come in and cause and kill more people like Tom and Emily Bullock. So there was a deep amount of anger within official circles, but also within uh, South Fermanagh itself. The permissive view taken by the security forces over loyalists blowing up the bridge served to encourage extremists to plan something bigger. Urged on by Vanguard to hit back, they raised the ante. Just four days after the Bailey Bridge opened to traffic, three no-warning car bombs were driven across the border, a response so severe that only the battle hardened saw it coming. Violence was almost a daily way of life, and the the extent to which people like myself and the department were following it was such that, sadly, no, it didn't take us by surprise, no, no. Blind retaliation. It's pretty obvious I have no sympathies with the thinking behind that. It was a known goal, I, I, I do believe. It, it created disgust amongst Loyalists and Protestants at such a thing being done in their name. It was a mistake to uh, conclude that the UDA and the UVF were complete cretins. An awful lot of them were, but not all of them. Some of them had a, the ability to make strategic, uh, to do some strategic thinking and, and uh, decide that if you do A, you likely have B, C and D as a result. So what was the purpose of bombing Belturbet? To, to, to teach Cavan County Council and the South that we don't want the bridge and don't you dare put it there again. Well, some would say that it was a retaliation for the Bullock murders? Well, it, 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 was, all in the, it was all in the one, yes, it was all in the one. Uh, and for a whole lot of other things, for, for all the UDR um, uh, men that were, were, were killed in Fermanagh. You know, let, let the other side get a taste of uh, what it's like. Mm. I don't know about tragedies now. Yeah, tragedies may be an overused word, but I, I think it was it was a it was a murder. Now there was there was there was there was no justification for it. You know, no justification for a lot of things that happened here. But it certainly was a it was just a murder. There was no there was no plan in it. Had the British Army and RUC Special Branch moved to arrest loyalists that blew up the Ahalane Bridge, it would have changed the drastic sequence of events that occurred here. But according to Major Vernon Rees, the security forces instead colluded with them. The Stanleys and O'Reillys will always wonder if rounding up South Fermanagh paramilitaries in November would have discouraged loyalists from taking things further in December and saved the lives of two innocent teenagers. Two days after Bell Turbot, senior officers from the British Army, RUC and UDR met to review border security. Minutes from that meeting were sealed for 84 years. The reasons given are for health and safety. It does suggest a huge sensitivity about what was, what was actually discussed. I think, the whole, I think that whole month, December 1972, um, is, is not available. So clearly there may be many sensitive things within that month for the uh, records of, this, of the particular British Army Brigade that operated in County Fermanagh. The Stanley and O'Reilly families continued to campaign for justice, frustrated by a lack of progress with the Garda investigation. For parents, living agony. I'm not being there to take 
Ik heb hem mijn arms en ik oh, hou kom. Dat wil ik vergeten. Poor daddy, right up until the morning he died, all he wanted was answers, and they were never given. Well, I just felt that we, you know, there was nothing we done, and that was it. You know, there was no... Our lives didn't mean nothing. No, no you didn't. You, were, you just didn't mean nothing, you know. It was just the same as nobody had died, you know. Yet it was, yet it was my sister. But the template had been set for cross-border, no-warning attacks. On May 17, 1974, four car bombs in Dublin and Monaghan killed 33 civilians and an unborn child and injured over 250. A Garda investigation was completed in three months. Nobody has ever been charged or convicted. You had the greatest loss of life in a single day. It was wrapped up in a matter of weeks. All, got, all finished. Attack on the 17th of May and um, investigation report the 9th of August, 74. I mean, 50 people were killed in the Republic as a result of cross-border attacks, mainly bombings, uh, but also a number of shootings. And how many convictions followed those fatalities? Zero. And then, unexpectedly, three and a half years after Bill Turbot, a breakthrough. In 1976, Gardaí charged UDR man George Farrell with causing explosions in Bell Turbot, as well as Pettigo, Swanlebar and Black Lion. However, his trial focused solely on Pettigo, where there were no fatalities or injuries. If he had been prosecuted for Bell Turbot, that was a much more serious affair because two young people had been killed and a great deal more would have come out, may have come out in the wash and uh, maybe people didn't want that to come out in the wash. George Farrell was sentenced to 15 years for the Pettigo attack. He named six accomplices, including Enniskillen loyalist Robert Bridge. Farrell was released after appealing the legality of his detention. He was re-arrested and charged again, not for Bell Turbot, but for a lesser offence in Donegal. He was sentenced to 18 months, but because he had already served more than 18 months, he walked free from the court. A null prosecutor was entered in respect of all other charges against George Farrell. So Bell Turbot was dropped? It's just incredible. The Irish government appointed an independent commission to inquire into Dublin Monaghan. Cross-border attacks like Bell Turbot and Clonus were added to the review, but crucially, the British government refused to cooperate. Its findings, named after Justice Henry Barron, were published in 2004. For relatives of the victims, it brought deep disappointment. Basically, they've given us a lovely fancy binder with a few hundred pages and told us nothing new in it. I only want the truth. Truth. We had to search for it yeah. in the Baron report, and that was a couple of lines. Yeah. Do you feel you've been left behind? Yeah. 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 The Baron inquiry was extremely focused on what happened in Dublin and Monaghan, and Bell Turbot was given insignificant attention. Um, and intelligence leads, you know, the, the few scraps, important scraps that the guards had, were simply not followed up properly. One of the Gardaí on duty at Athlane Bridge that night told Baron he recalled stopping what turned out to be the bomb car. The driver gave a false name and address. The Garda could not describe a front seat female passenger and was unsure if a second passenger was in the back. Baron states these photo fits of the driver were based on two eyewitness accounts. The driver is believed to have returned across the border, but there's no record of the Garda photo fits being passed to the RUC. Well, I mean, there are other instances of photo fits uh, being uh, shown in the, um, being published in the newspapers, certainly. Um, so why not? Why, would, why, why was it not done then? It wasn't just the shoddy work that went on that night. It was the shoddy work that followed. You know, it was the shoddy work that no matter what Daddy did, um, that nothing came back to him. 
Errors and oversights were not confined to south of the border. The bombers stole a car from Bell Turbot on the night of the attack. Three days later, the getaway car was spotted by the RUC, parked in North Belfast with false Antrim plates. Rather than preserve it for examination, the RUC called in the bomb squad. The British Army blew it up and it actually caught fire and burnt out. So it seems very strange that that car wasn't um, uh, fingerprinted or no forensics carried out on it until after it was burnt, which was obviously too late. Denied access to British intelligence, the Barron report was unable to identify key suspects. I'm afraid everything seems to be completely locked up and um, the Barron report, I think, illustrated you know, how difficult it was to come to any conclusion uh, without access to that information. And I know that subsequent to the Barron report, the um, Irish government continues to try and press the British government to release the papers, and um, I don't see any sign of it yet, and I'm not optimistic that it will happen in my lifetime. But as we'll see in part three, the British security forces had their own ideas about who might have been involved. We know from the British Army's own records from this period that there were other people that they had identified um, as being much more significant in their view um, in the bombing of Belt Herbert, Clonus and Pettigrew. What happened in Belt Herbert 48 years ago had a profound impact on the families affected. Pictured here as a baby, Patrick Stanley's short life ended before his youngest sister, Susan, was even born. Mammy would tell you that she felt Susan curl up into a ball inside her and stayed there. She had a difficult delivery, and when Susan was born, Susan actually had two broken arms. It, it was, uh, how do I, it was horrific on her. What it was, was, was grief. While the Standys lost their oldest boy, the O'Reillys lost their youngest girl. I was very, very close to Geraldine. She, she came everywhere with me in the car and football matches or anywhere I was going. I, she just came and just doted on. The Gardaí have compiled six reports on Bell Turbot. Each time the families have asked the Department of Justice for access, they're told that because the case remains active, sharing information could interfere with the investigation. Furthermore, it could reasonably be expected to affect adversely the security of the state, matters relating to Northern Ireland and the international relations of the state. I think we have a right to know anyway. Yeah. You know, I think we have a right to know that somebody tried to bring them to justice. Justice Barron shone a light uh, on a rotten situation. Um, but he wasn't able to go beyond that. He wasn't able to say uh, who did what, when or why. However, the Barron report did name one suspect for Bell Turbot, Robert Bridge from Enniskillen, the same Robert Bridge named by George Farrell as an accomplice for the Pettigo attack. One month before Bell Turbot, his name cropped up in a Cavan Monaghan Garda file, UDA activities in County Fermanagh. Robbie Bridge was named. But unfortunately, that report uh, is now missing. It's another missing document. Mm. Well, I knew Robert Bridge. Not from any uh, of his association with the UVF, and uh, I didn't know about that until that report came out. But I would not see him, and I don't want to speak ill of him now, but I would not see him as a frontline warrior by any means. In fact, Barron was far from conclusive, saying it was satisfied Robert Bridge was involved in the bombing of Bell Turbot, but without intelligence on other groups or individuals, many questions remain unanswered. It is quite certain that those same questions were aired at a key meeting of British security forces two days after Bell Turbot. Fortunately, we don't have access to the records for that meeting. 
and they're still closed and will be closed until uh, 2057. 2057? Yeah. So anything that was discussed about Bell Turbot is closed until everybody who's lived, who lived through it is gone? Yes. I have no doubt it's because of institutional embarrassment, and the reason they don't release papers is they don't want to admit to what they did. In 1975, Robert Bridge was sentenced to 15 years for a murder in Fermanagh. Senior Gardaí then made a request to the RUC Assistant Chief Constable that Bridge be interviewed in relation to Bill Turbot. There is no evidence that this was done. You know, the lack of a trusting relationship between Dublin and London to start with, the total absence of any system of cooperation between the Gardaí and the RUC, I mean, both of those were huge obstacles to any effective um, investigation. Since his release from jail, Robert Bridge has denied any involvement in bombing Bell Turbot. We caught up with him last month. Hello, Robert Bridge. Yeah. My, uh, my, my bottom was the day away. That's who my not the people. The families of the victims, as far as they're concerned, they read the Baron report and they see your name on it. Whatever happens, happens when I get there. I had nothing to do with it. I want to make sure they are absolutely clear. Tonight, RTE investigates can disclose that British intelligence had identified another suspect, an associate of Robert Bridge. Just four months after the December 28 attacks, the security forces were aware of a UDA commando-type gang from Belfast who were believed responsible for various explosions in ERA. Military files obtained by Dr. Edward Burke do not specify which explosions they are referring to, but they do name the suspected leader of the UDA commando team, Billy McMurray. Uh, McMurray was, was seen by the security forces as part of the, uh, very much part of the UDA response. They were sending somebody who was um, a serious player from Belfast to try and sort of um, extend uh, the UDA, uh, UDA's reach to the border areas and to carry out um, attacks uh, south of the border. Why wasn't that information passed to the guards? I, I simply have no idea. I, I don't know. It's a very significant uh, lead. McMurray, a 36-year-old plumber, came from Rathcool, a loyalist stronghold outside Belfast. But it wasn't just the army who were watching his movements. In December 72, he came to the attention of the RUC in bizarre circumstances when four bullets were found in a rental car he had hired. That information was immediately passed on to Special Branch in Belfast. Uh, it was a full month later when they went to his house and searched it and found weapons and uh, UDA and U both UDA and UVF um, memorabilia. And uh, he was arrested at that stage and charged with uh, possession. And he was convicted of that. In court, McMurray made no secret of his affiliations. Before being sentenced to six months for firearms offences, he declared himself liaison officer for the UDA in Fermanagh and Tyrone. Andy Thierry was UDA Supreme Commander in 1973. We wanted to ask him about Billy McMurray, but he declined to take part in this programme. With McMurray detained, the British Army reported no militant Protestant activity during the period, a lull they attribute to his arrest with a UDA associate. They came to the conclusion that uh, once McMurray was out of the picture, uh, loyalist attacks uh, particularly in the border area around Fermanagh, um, really diminished. That was the opinion of the security forces in Northern Ireland. However, the rental car found with bullets would link him to the notorious murder of Louis Leonard in Derry Lynn. Still unsolved, the case was revisited four decades later by the PSNI's historical inquiries team. The HET review summary report identified mistakes and missed opportunities amounting to a significant failing by RUC investigators. It referred to McMurray as Suspect A. A member of Rathcool UDA, acting Lieutenant Colonel for Fermanagh and Tyrone. Even more telling, 
The HET also confirmed that in late 1972 intelligence was received that a UDA team was being formed to carry out terrorist attacks in the south and north. The team was being organised by Suspect A. The families of the victims in Belturwood will be just astonished to hear that somebody who was characterised as a prime mover, loyal, a paramilitary loyalist, active in Fermanagh at that time and responsible for cross-border attacks, and yet his name doesn't appear in the Baron report, mm. and that there's no indication that any information on him was passed over to the guards. Absolutely. A prime suspect that the RUC and, and the British Army strongly suspect are being involved in, in, in the attacks south of the border. The RUC should be uh, either interviewing themselves, but clearly in cooperation with the guards in terms of the investigation into the murders in, in Belt Herbert in December 1972. When we asked why vital police intelligence was not passed on to the Gardaí, the PSNI said it would provide cooperation and assistance as required by any current or future investigation by Angarda Siakana. The Ministry of Defence in London did not wish to comment on the matter. Billy McMurray left for the UK soon after the state prosecutor dropped a case against him for armed robbery. When we asked the Gardaí what they knew about him, the Gardaí said they do not comment on ongoing investigations. McMurray remained in England until his death last year, aged 83. Was he being protected? I don't know. But there needs to be an explanation given as to why this worrying pattern of behaviour of deliberately preventing intelligence or deliberately trying to not pass intelligence uh, south of the border about a man who the British security forces themselves believed was uh, the key border commando unit for the UDA. I mean, that, that deserves an explanation. Many paramilitaries from the 1970s have since passed away. Those still alive are reluctant to say what they know. Whether the bombs planted on December 28th required assistance from loyalists in Portadown, Derry, Belfast or elsewhere remains unclear. Probably the person that planted it is not in this world. And probably the person that turned it planted is not in this world, so... Who do you, who do you go after then? No. The Bailey Bridge at Ahelaine was blown up after just two weeks, cutting off Belturbet from South Fermanagh for the next 26 years. I suppose in loyalists' terms, it was effective. The bombs in places like Belturbet, Pedigo, Monaghan and so on. I don't know whether the tactic was to specifically attack the IRA, but I think it was to attack uh, Southern Territory, uh, to give them a taste of their own medicine, as it were. For many who belong to these borderlands, a deep sense of loss means lasting hurt, hopes of justice, forlorn and fading. think about them a lot. Yeah, never forgot them. Never, never will. I know it's a, they're waiting on somebody to come that feels guilty about it, and I, which I don't think will ever happen, you know? So I said... So there was that, no stone left unturned? I don't think there was too many stones thrown at all, you know? Push to one side, forget it happened. It's, you know, two people died. There's, there's worse going on. Is it too late for answers? No. It's never too late for answers. It's never too late for the truth. No. Yeah, exactly. No. Never. <laughs>